Hey everyone, and welcome to another video. Today I'm interviewing WGA screenwriter Dominic Morgan on his time actually breaking into the industry. How are you, Dominic? I'm good, thanks, Tyler. Glad to have you actually that's, on. That's a shitty. No, we're rolling okay. with it. We're how, rolling with it. <laughs> okay. Oh, really? How am I? How the, I mean, that's the question. How, how are we all right now? <laughs> we're hanging in there by our fingertips. <laughs> So yeah, no, no, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah. I think when anyone asks you how are you, if you actually answer it honestly, we're all going to be here a long time. So I'll just lie. I'm fantastic, <laughs> mate. I'm absolutely. Well, fantastic. I'm actually fantastic, and I'm glad to be talking to you today. Um, I wanted to talk to you and this about the process of selling your first screenplay, breaking into the industry, and just kind of getting started because I think that that is what is the most confusing for a lot of new writers of how to actually get in and understanding how other people actually broke in and got started. So I wanted to ask you about the process of selling your first screenplay. I broke in to the film industry in the 20th century, which was a very different landscape, but equally the fundamentals, many of the fundamentals were the same. And the key point for me, I'd been messing around with screenwriting. I'd taken some courses. There were no online courses, um, but I did a couple of Michael. I went to a Michael Haig course. I did some, I, I went to a class. But the moment when I properly committed was one Saturday morning when I had the biggest hangover in the world and the Irish Republican Army detonated a truck bomb of fertilizer about 100 meters from my house and it sort of blew me out of bed it took out the windows and every window for about a quarter of a mile and from that day i properly committed to pursuing what i wanted to do with my life because you know you only get one shot so that's when i really focused and i teamed up with a very good mate of mine matt harvey and we didn't actually have a plan we just been watching a lot of action movies. And in fact, the Michael Haig screenwriting course, the set text was speed. And, you know, this is only five years after Die Hard. It was about 95, 96. And we wrote this action thriller and Matt was an actor. I was an advertising salesman. And I just queried a couple of people when we'd finished it. And one of the agents, his favorite place in the entire world was the Drakensberg Valley in South Africa. And this movie, the first line of the script huh. was exterior Drakensberg Valley, South Africa day. So that predisposed huh. him to reading on and he did read on and it was like an action flick set in a diamond mine. We called it mine hard. And um, he sold it within two weeks. He had two offers. He sent it to a couple of contacts in Hollywood and a British producer here called Richard Jackson, who'd just done Rob Roy. Very interesting character, very unlike any producer I've ever met in my life. He was privately funded. He didn't sort of hobnob with, with all the big shots in Wardour Street. He had his own means and he did things his own way. So he bought this script, Hell's Ladder. And then he sent us a book, which was a children's kind of novel a kind of you know a, a prototypical harry potter type story except it didn't work and matt kind of wanted to do it and i actually said i don't think this is going to work and so we turned him down and then he did something extraordinary we'd mentioned another idea about these death squads in brazil that were executing street children at the time in the 90s because they were committing a lot of street crime so the cops were paid by the shopkeepers like 50 bucks a kid to kill them. And we had a story set in this world and we mentioned it to him. And after we turned him down, he came back to us. He said, all right, I'll offer you a three picture deal. I'll give you a rewrite of, you know, I'll pay for a rewrite for the action movie in the diamond mine. You will adapt this book and I'll pick up your pitch and um that was it matt left his stop being an actor i stopped selling advertising but the absolute sort of moment was when all the extras happened because we got the deal points through the post from our agent wow. no emails and just listed these three deals like you're gonna get x thousand for this and we could see that we could i could see i could leave my job 
And then at the end, it just said, P.S., um, Richard thinks you should go to South America. So he's going to sponsor a research trip to Rio. And I just thought, wow. And it was wow. And we went down there and we went business class, which I'd never been business class. And we had a bodyguard because what we were actually doing was a little bit suspect. And we did need him. And that actually, the movie didn't get made, but that was the creative experience of my life, not selling a mine hard, not working on this kids adaptation, which didn't work out, but on going into the favelas, hanging out with drug dealers, with street kids, crime scenes, seeing my first dead body, all of that stuff. It kind of, I remember I came back and around the, the sort of Christmas lunch table and my brother, Paul, same background as me, said something. I thought, that sounds a bit callous. And I really exploded at him. He goes, why do you care? And I thought, why do I care? And I think, you know, aged 28, something had changed because of what I'd seen. And yeah, we pushed on from there. So that three picture deal, um, sort of, uh, that was our first foot. So we didn't sell one script, we sold three. Wow. And at that point, how much have you had you written before that? Like how many screenplays had you written before you had interest on those? Uh, it was our second, well, I'd written a screenplay that got optioned for 500 pounds, which is about $650. Before this? I actually had it. Uh, before this? Before this, yeah. Yeah, and it, I, I somebody set me up with a very small sort of theatrical agent and we were totally wrong. And when I told her I was going to write a movie in a diamond mine, she goes, oh, I thought you'd do something a little bit more personal. So I realized that this is, yeah, you have to be personal. But when you're writing Speed or my, you know, uh, Die Hard in a Mine, she was the wrong person. She was a good sure. agent, but just wrong for me. So I, I never really talk about that I, um, because I, I didn't see that. You know, I got a check for 500 pounds and I framed it somewhere. But my real career didn't start until I started working with Matt and we sold the first script that we wrote together. Now, Matt, he was wanted to be an actor. And for him, this is just something that we did in the weekend. It was one of his many creative pursuits. And then that locked us in as a partnership. So I think that, you know, there's so much we could go into one day talking about how to survive a writing partnership. We were together for 17 years. We're not together anymore, but, um, you write with somebody if it works you're a brand you're a team and you should think about that before you start writing with someone for sure for sure so it seems like when you're that getting that initial foothold it wasn't that painful of a process for you or was it it was a miracle tyler it i mean no we, we were playing well wow. we were two guys who loved action movies and we wrote this action movie you know and then things started happening Catherine Bigelow was going to direct it the, the the high point was about one month after I had my my um my then wife gave birth to my son and just after that we got a call from Richard saying listen get ready you're going to LA Samuel Jackson wants to do it he's going to give you his notes wow and I remember hanging up I just wept you know this this doesn't happen on your first script and I've wept many times since then, but um, the point was there was a harsh lesson because none of these films got made mm. and, the, and the, the figures were massive. I mean, we saw these three scripts and two and a half percent of the budget. They're all $20 million movies. And, you know, you, you have big flaws and you get a minimum of 250 and going up to 750. And that's the other thing that this deal did. And it became a bit of an I don't know, it wasn't an albatross, but it set an expectation. Um, so over our 17 year career, Matt and I, I think did 30 deals. Um, six things got made, not everything that we wrote on, we got credited on. But there were things that where the numbers were so low and had nothing to do with our big things. And I remember, yeah, I mean, that's mistake territory, but um, but the good news was, is that when we sold our fourth script, we had a track record and our quote was the quote of the, the big three that we started with. Um, 
So yeah, one of the problems of get what one of the challenges of when you start selling scripts is your quote is in America, certainly, you know, it's WGA sort of scale plus 10% or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't start with that. Um, but then again, these movies didn't get made. So um, we did well out of them. But uh, we thought that if a producer is going to send you to Rio de Janeiro, and he also sent us other places as well. And you know, give you a thousand pounds a day bodyguard to keep you alive mm -hmm. and invest huge sums of money of his own money, then of course, one of these is going to get made. And I remember feeling like the mistake afterwards, I felt a bit disappointed in him. And it's ridiculous. He was the, he is the producer, Richard Jackson made Rob Roy is the, the, the best sort of human being I've met in the film industry. But I think because he was our first person, we thought that everybody was as cool as Richard and they're not. Mm. Gotcha. It, wasn't just, it wasn't just the money and the, you know, and the business class tickets and the bodyguard and all of that. It was because you know, we had to, there was a chilling moment when we got on the plane, um, we got a, a FedEx thing and we had to sign a waiver that if we got killed, we wouldn't sue him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's crazy. Because we were investigating all these cops who were murdering street kids. Right. And then, and the whole plan was that we had to stay, you know, keep it low key. And then on the third day, some, the, one of the newspapers found out about it and wrote it up saying these two British screenwriters are researching a movie about urban violence in Rio. And, um, yeah, we, we, yeah, things happened, but. Um, we got out of there and it was the best education I've ever had in my life. Gotcha. So looking at kind of the initial lessons that you learned going through that process, it really seems like that was easy in a lot of ways. And then you sort of learned lessons after that initial three projects about how the industry really worked and how things really operated. Is that how that worked? Well, I think because Richard was outside the industry, he, you know, right. One of the reasons he didn't make our movies is he went and bought a film studio up in Canada and made a, he spec'd a $30 million TV show called The Secret Avengers of Jules Verne. Um, I think at one point Spielberg was going to do it. And I remember he said, well, I don't need Spielberg. He didn't. He, he, he just was, you know, he was this guy. So it, it was atypical. Mm, sure. The lessons about the film industry, which were much more typical, came later. Mm. And what were those that you kind of so many? I mean, in what you name? Which... So going from going from the strategy, mm -hmm. there's creative, there's, right. there's so much. I mean, there were 30 projects that we worked on for 30 different producers. When you went from from those initial three projects into the fourth, what were the main things that you learned, like moving out of his ecosystem? You know, you said he was atypical, but moving into out of him what were you realizing working on that fourth project? That, um, I get, you know, the fourth was actually, the, the producers were pretty good. That, it, see, again, we were spoiled. <laughs> we sold this story. Um, it was actually a friend of my brother's had gone into film and her and her business partner optioned an idea about these tourists who get kidnapped uh, on an overland trip. This is where you get on a British army truck. And it was like 10, you know, Americans, Brits, Polish people, all, all on the same truck and they get kidnapped. And again, we managed to say, well, we'd like to go on a, on a three week trip around Africa, learning what it's like. And they said, yes. So we had another, you know, <laughs> do you know what the thing that I keep on, I'm not, I'm not whinging. If I look back on my whole career, mm -hmm. the highlights were not the movies getting made. They were experiences of meeting real people and exploring. We went to the Falklands, we went to Turkey, we went to Argentina. That is the wealth, not my credits. I'm, I'm not impressed by my credits and I don't think anyone else should be. I've, you know, I tag, I you know some decent stuff. I got an award for a Mandela movie, but it's the, it was the experience of leaving my hometown and going into these different cultures, some of them hostile environments, places like South Africa, Mm. and you know connecting with real stories um mm. so yeah i don't know but the, the what did i learn mistakes um my biggest mistakes have probably all been to do with money mm. and the way i managed it 
and feast and famine that I've had years where it's six figures and then two years where literally nothing. I made mm -hmm. a, a video about it, you know, what do screenwriters really earn? And um, past performance is no prediction of future performance. Mm -hmm. And if you earn six figures one year and you don't put anything aside for tax and then you don't earn anything for two years, it's madness. And then I think financial, this is what most people don't realize. They think they're going to sell a script for Malibu money and uh, they should be thinking about building a brand and creating a body of work that allows them to get hired over and over again because they specialized in one thing. We were like, you know, we were going down to a shooting range with a rifle. So imagine you go shooting, you know, you, you go down with your sniper rifle to the range and there's a target, but you can't see what the target is, but you're just firing in the hope that you might hit it. And if, you know, when I, I've, I'm now not writing at the moment, I have a couple of projects that I'm uh, looking to set up, but I concentrate on other things. And what I now pass on to my clients and anyone who cares to listen is work out what the target is before you start creating all your, all your work there is a connection between creative and financial mm. and people who say, Oh, I don't want to think about money. Well, you won't be able to be creative in a way that you'd love to, unless you can support yourself and your family. So I think most of my mistakes are financial. And I've also done, um, I'd fall out with people about money um, because producers, they're always short or they say they're short and they are continually asking you to work for free. And sometimes you have to do it. And sometimes you don't. And it's really hard to figure out when you're going to be altruistic and be part of the team and when you're going to play hardball. Um, I think probably my biggest, my two biggest mistakes, if I think, you know, the things that haunt me, you can make strategic mistakes um, because you make a decision and it doesn't work out. That's not a mistake you're taking all the information. So say you have two offers on a script and you decide I'm going to go with this producer. And then you realize that they're total scumbags and you wish you'd taken the lower offer and gone. You didn't know that. Mm -hmm. You didn't know that they were going to turn out to be Frankenstein until you walked in through into their house. That's not a mistake. That's, <laughs> that's the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a particular negotiation, which I was responsible for torpedoing. And again, it was money. It was a passion project. And the producer um, went on to make some huge stuff. And they were, the deal was missing a lot of money, but it was a passion project. It was, we optioned this book by Don McCullin, a photojournalist. He's a very famous British photojournalist. And we got the rights. We had a good relationship. We'd spent months interviewing him. We had this script. Initially, it sold to Jude Law's company. They went bust and it came back to us. And this producer made us an offer where if they, he fired us, we'd get like 40 grand on a 20, 30 million dollar movie. So it was a bad deal. You know, you, you should be getting two and a half to three percent on a movie and maybe half that if you share credit. This mm -hmm. was this was a bad deal. But the option mm -hmm. with the photojournalist was running out. And this was a passion project. And we should have just taken the haircut and done the deal because sometimes a bad deal is better than no deal. And we didn't do the deal. Mm -hmm. They went on to make Slumdog Millionaire. It was Celador. I'll tell you, it's Celador. I didn't care anymore. It's, it's Celador. You know, they made Who Wants to Make a Million, Be a Millionaire. They were massively rich. Um, but they were, you know, they were lowballing us. And our option expired with McCullin. We lost the rights to wow. the book. Working title picked mm. it up a couple of years ago. They were going to do it with Tom Hardy. They couldn't crack it. It's a hard script. And now Angelina, Angelina Jolie, you know, 10 years later is going to direct it. Wow. And we should have mm -hmm. taken the deal. So mm -hmm. that was a mistake. And it was to do with what I came back to at the beginning, which is you get your quote. This is my quote. And the film, yeah, if you're in the studio world, if you're continually working with studios, that is your quote. But mm -hmm. the film business is not about studios, especially now that it's all these indie companies and sales companies and half of them, you know, I mean, I think the problem with producers, Tyler, that, you know, 
70% of them are absolutely stand up men and women. You know, they're good people. Mm. There's about 20% that if you don't get the contract right, they won't be able to help themselves. They will take advantage of you and they will screw you. Mm. And then there's about 10% and they should be locked up. I mean, these are criminals. Mm -hmm. These are fraudsters. These are people who you write, write a contract that says you've got the next step and they'll just ignore it and they'll do what they want. So that, that's who you're dealing with. But I think mm. it's very easy to have a couple of bad experiences with the 20%, the shysters, and then be so worried about getting screwed by the 70% who are decent that in a way those relationships are going to sour. Sure. Um, this probably, I'm not sure how relevant this is. To no, that makes sense. That makes sense. These are problems that I think most writers, like I, I'm looking forward to the day when I'm being paid and I'm, I'm having these problems. I mean, these are sort right. of, you know, these are entitled problems. And I think <laughs> that if you're breaking in, you know, the biggest thing that you need to look at is stop thinking about one script mm. and stop focusing on that one script. That is part of your narrative and you need to create a body of work of similar things and then you're worth something and somebody can say so you know you did a video on contained threads right. mm -hmm. so look at strict chris sparling he he wrote buried but he also which is a contained thriller the ultimate gold standard of contained thrillers but he also wrote atm which is a sort of siege movie set in an atm it's, no, it's nowhere mm -hmm. nearly as good as buried but he proved he could do it in the same genre twice therefore he has a brand right right that makes so much sense and i wanted to ask you that if you could go back to the very start of your career what would you do differently i would have taken that mccullin deal i think that when we went to america the other big mistake uh we were very hot we sold we had a spec that sold uta we signed with uta with them for a couple of years and then what happened is um, I would have moved to LA sooner. I, you know, we went out for two months at a time, very expensive. We should have got out there the moment we signed with UTA. I couldn't, I, my son, I had a second, third, third child coming. So I don't regret not going out there because I had to be with my family. But we were, we had this period after we signed with UTA where there are a lot of open writing assignments every mm. other day. It was like Bowfinger, a UPS truck would turn up and there's the galleys for another spy novel or a comic book like G.I. Joe. We're pitching on all these stuff, all this thing, you know, these movies like G.I. Joe, we pitched on them and the writers who were up against were in the room. Mm. And, you know, and you knew you were on a, you know, on a hiding to nowhere where you're on the phone to an executive and they're going through, was it a Kawanga pass or whatever? And you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you just think we've spent an absolute, you know, Matt's in Belfast, I'm in Winchester and we prepped this. We should be in the room. And when we did go over there and get in the room, our chances of getting jobs was exponential. So I would have, I should have gone over to LA earlier. And also when we went cold at UTA, this is the other thing that again, you know, people starting out, they may not think this is relevant, but just remember this when you get there, mm -hmm. that if you ask any writer who's got an agent or is in, or is in the WGA, if their career is cold, they say, my agent doesn't take my calls. My agent is not putting me up for jobs. My agent isn't replying to me. The problem's the agent, right? Well, not necessarily. The problem is that you should be asking, well, why? Now, it may be that they just hip pocketing you because mm -hmm. they wanted to see if it's going to work and they're being lazy. Right. But actually agents have only got a finite amount of time and they will only concentrate their quality time on the 10% of clients who are going to get them the most money. Right. So if they're not concentrating on you, it, you know, for us, my biggest mistake was, um, the spec that we wrote was very good that they signed us on the next spec was a huge mistake. Um, instead of workshopping it with, you know, five or six professional writers who give us feedback, we thought, well, now we know what we're doing. And we submitted the script because straight away to the agent without getting feedback from our kind of, you know, on our high, sure. because we now knew what we were doing. And they thought it was probably a six out of 10. Mm. And the last script they thought was a nine out of 10, at which point 
you've killed off half their excitement and then they'll stay with you. And we did get a couple of jobs, but eventually it came to the point where the agent was not returning the calls. And so um, we fired them and we went to APA who did some great work for us. But actually the work, the reason why it worked with APA is we wrote better scripts. Mm. And because we were writing better scripts, we started to, you know, make more inroads. Now, what we should have done is rather than fired UTA, we should have stuck with it and said, the problem is not them, it's us. The problem is that our material is not good enough. And the reason they're not returning our calls is because we haven't yet delivered we should be delivering at least one or two pieces of work every year. And we didn't do that. Mm. Um, and I think if you think about mistakes, you know, the biggest mistake I'm, you know, Matt, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking for Matt here. I'm talking for myself. My biggest mistake was not educating myself enough on, I, I you know, I, I'm very, very strong on story on, on plot and, on character as a consultant, but as a writer, my weak spot was character. And remember, there was no YouTube back then. So, um, I mean, you know, it, it was coming in, but there are, you know, you, you don't need to go to film school anymore. Right. That all the information that you could have got in film school, in some, some cases, is better information on YouTube than there is if you go and drop 50 grand in UCLA. So I think my, I'm going to own my mistake, which I was a sort of seven out of 10 character writer. And that didn't matter for features because it's less important if you're writing a genre thriller spec. Um, less important, it's still absolutely fundamental. And now you, there's no, you, you've got to be brilliant at plot and character. But back then you didn't. Mm -hmm. You could earn a decent living by being a seven out of 10 character writer and sort of an eight and above you know, whatever. Um, but then there was the big shift where everybody started writing television and my weakness or my, not, yeah, my, I wasn't, I was a seven out of 10 character writer, sometimes a six. And when I pivoted to television, um, that was exposed. So I think mm -hmm. if I had my time again, I would have looked at building my character muscles um, because that was the weak point. So you need to identify what your weak points are. And even if you're selling script, don't put your head in the sand and say, you know, well, I'm earning money, things must be good because eventually you're gonna run out of steam. Right. You must deliver on story, on character and structure and plot and all of those things. So I think there are, you know, I spoke earlier about my tactical mistakes in, in terms of my career strategy, but I think creatively, I should have educated myself better in terms mm. of story and in particular character. Absolutely. That makes so much sense. Well, Dominic, it's been great talking with you a little bit about your experience breaking in, some of the problems that you came across, what you would have done differently. Um, and if you are a screenwriter that is trying to break into the industry right now, if you have those few screenplays and you're trying to bring those to that cell level and get the industry navigation that you need to actually move into the industry, uh, then Dominic and I have a program called High Level Screenwriting where we are helping you do just that. We are helping you bring that screenplay to the cell ready level and give you the industry navigation that you need to actually be successful. So if that's something you're interested in, click the top link in the description below. Thank you so much for talking with me today, Dominic. It's been a pleasure.